Hello, good to see everybody. We are in the book of Isaiah uh, as we look today at another person meeting God. In this case, we're talking about meeting God in a vision. And we are naturally speaking about the prophet Isaiah. So if you would, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, uh, let's begin together at verse 1 and, and see how this story unfolds. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. Now, if you're like me, just reading that uh, brief uh, depiction of this vision that I, Isaiah had is uh, awe-inspiring. It must have been awe-inspiring to him. We see a little bit uh, of that. Isaiah gets to see in this vision uh, the Lord in his majesty. And you talk about majesty, just think about that. The entire room of the temple is filled up with the robes of God. Not God, but the robes of God. That's remarkable. And even though he saw God in his glory, the sight, number one, must have been indescribable. There's almost no way to put that in human terms. But number two, it may be that he also was not allowed to describe, that, that uh, it was not ever in God's plan for him to tell uh, what he saw. Now, some of the things we know about this uh, comes from uh, later writings of inspired men. Uh, John, for example, in, uh, uh, in his book of, of John, chapter 12, verse 38, quotes from Isaiah, chapter 53. Let's look over there quickly at the book of John, John, chapter 12, uh, chapter 12 verse 38, where we find that the word of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Notice in regard to this that the word of Isaiah spoke, but what did he deliver? He delivered a message from God, or to God in this case, and the idea is, oh, who's going to listen to us anyway? Who's going to pay attention uh, to the things that we have to say? Uh, that's one place. Again, in the same uh, John chapter 12, he goes on beginning verse 39, Therefore, they could not believe because Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes and lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. Now, the first one I already said was from Isaiah 53, verse 1. This quote comes from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. We're going to see that a little bit later. But, but the point that we want to see and that we want to note here is that the prophet Isaiah is cited by John. And then John makes a powerful observation, one that might slip by, certainly did me for a time. Listen to what it says. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. He's not talking about Isaiah's glory. He's saying when he saw the glory of the Lord and spoke of him. These are the things he wrote. Now, this vision then may be similar uh, to the one that the Apostle Paul had. If you go to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, you'll remember that Paul has just... Uh, elaborated on many of the trials that he went through in his lifetime. And having done that, he then uh, goes on to say this, It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast, 
I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Now that's chapter 12, verse 1 of 2 Corinthians. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, uh, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I, I do not know, God knows, how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Now, of course, the one that had that vision was Paul himself. We see that as we're going down to verse 7, where Paul reports there was given him a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet him, lest he should be exalted above measure. Boy, you, you talk about exaltation. If, if you or I were taken up into heaven to the very throne room of God, we might be tempted to be pretty proud of ourselves. I mean, nobody else around me has ever had that happen. And very few, if any, in Paul's time could have said that it had happened to them. So I don't know why Isaiah doesn't give us more details. It may be that what he saw, he could not really put into words. That's a possibility. It's indescribable to him. Or it may be that he's not allowed to speak about some of the things that he hears. He's got a very, very important job uh, to do for the Lord. It may be that this is going to sustain him. God would know that kind of a thing. I would not. And so we, we have to leave this to, in part, to our curiosity, if you would, and just wait for, for the Lord himself to explain it to us, uh, maybe in heaven when we get there. Uh, there are a number of other things, though, in the vision that he does talk about. For example, he speaks about the seraphim in verse 2. Seraphim were celestial beings. They were an angelic order. And by the way, there are several orders of angels, according to various passages. We get a little brief insight into that. He stood above God, ready to serve at his call, along with the cherubim. So we've got seraphim and cherubim. Now anybody that knows anything about uh, the Ark of the Covenant knows that there were two cherubim around it, wings outstretched, to, uh, as it were, the two sets of wings meeting over the mercy seat, which was representative of the throne of God. It's where the Shekinah of God or the glory of God would dwell among his people. Well, these seraphim that uh, Isaiah saw, he says, covered their faces in the presence of God. Now, I don't know if they were not allowed to look at God. I don't know if that's a matter of respect. I just know they covered their faces. And certainly there's at least an element of respect in it, maybe more than that. They constantly worshiped by singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. That word Holy would be our word for completely pure. God is completely pure, and the angels are constantly announcing that fact. He is the Lord of hosts. He's the Lord over armies, the hosts of heaven, and the hosts of, of individuals who, uh, saints and, and faithful, uh, not just of now, but of generations even gone by. Uh, it is, I think, uh, an important observation to make here that Isaiah repeatedly refers to God as the Holy One of Israel. He does that 29 times. In all the rest of Scripture, that expression is only used six times. So when you talk about Isaiah, you're talking about a, a prophet who was enamored with and awed by the Holy One of Israel, the God who had cared for his people for so many years. Now, while these angels stood ready to serve, the awesome majesty of God is seen, not in us seeing him, because there's no record of that here, but it is seen in the fact that the posts are shaken by the sound of his voice. Can you imagine a voice so loud that it shakes the posts? 
that's that's amazing. Uh, I remember some years ago, Teresa and I were invited to go watch a one professional football game. It's probably the only one I'll ever go to. Uh, we were uh, due to the where how far away we had to park and how slow we walk. We were just a little behind the start time. And let me tell you, when they kicked the ball off, you heard this roar go up from the stands, and it literally vibrated the windows around that great arena where they played football. But that was the voice of, well, maybe about 60,000 people. This is one voice, and it shakes the posts of the temple. And then, also in that awesomeness, you see the smoke that fills the room. So a very awesome sight. How would you respond to it? How would I respond to it? I suspect that if we were really thinking in the right way, that we might respond very much as Isaiah did. Look, look at verse 5, where we find, So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. This series that we're doing is a series on meeting God or on holy ground. And of course, of all the writers that we can talk about, outside of maybe Moses, who heard, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground, or Joshua, who heard a very similar thing, outside of those two, Isaiah probably is the one who the word holy stands out the most for us as, as we look at it. He's in front of the holy God of Israel. And all he can think about is how worthless I am. God is totally pure. Holy, holy, holy. Isaiah, Gary, you put your name in there. We're not totally pure. We're wicked. And I think that that would be very evident. And it was evident. Uh, to Isaiah. In some ways, uh, what Isaiah says about himself, how that, how that, as he, he said that he's a person of unclean lips, it reminds us a little bit of Leviticus chapter 13, which gives uh, directions for the, uh, for the leper. And as you read those directions, think, compare that somewhat to what you've just heard Isaiah say. Uh, this, uh, Leviticus 13, verse 45. Now the leper on whom the sore is, his clothes should be torn and his head bare, and he shall cover his mustache and cry, unclean, unclean. Now in the presence of God and his great, his total, his complete holiness, what impression did Isaiah have? It's a lot like, it seems to me, that of the, uh, of the leper. I I'm unclean. I, I'm not holy like you are. I, I don't deserve to be in this place. And that may actually explain why he doesn't join in the song. They may not have known the song. That, that'd be another part. But he doesn't join in. They repeatedly said it. You know, eventually I'd catch on. I'd be able to sing along. But maybe he was afraid to. Maybe he did not feel qualified to. I, I don't know. Later, he recognized that all of us really are like filthy rags. Go down to Isaiah chapter 64. The prophet is drawing very close now to the close of his epistle. And in Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6, here's what he says. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Everything that I do, that I think, well, this is, this is right, this is good, this is what God wants. Now, I, I might briefly think, he ought to recognize me for this. I'm doing what's right. Isaiah comes back and says, everything that I've done that was righteous is still like filthy rags in the presence of God. And that's true. 
It's true because of who we are and what we're about. Oh, yes, I, I may do good things that God wants, and they could be described as righteous if I'm doing what God has directed in his righteous word. But even though I do that, I also do other things of which I'm ashamed. I'm embarrassed. Sin that needs to be taken care of in my life. I want us briefly to compare what the Lord said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. He's, he's going through what we call the Beatitudes. So we, a better way to put it be the blessings. These are people that be blessed. Listen to him particularly in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I think Isaiah is recognizing that he is poor in spirit, that he knows that he does not deserve to be in the presence of God. And compare it with one other uh, passage. It's the book of Acts, it's chapter 22. Paul is standing uh, at that time before that angry mob. He's explaining uh, somewhat why he did what he did. And listen to this beginning in verse 6. Now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, Suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there you'll be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And since I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me. And he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at the same hour, I looked up at him. And he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. A couple of things to note there. First of all, he's brother Saul, because as you can see, Ananias was a Jew just like he was. So they're brethren in the flesh, but they're not yet brethren in the spirit. And how do I know that? It's because Saul has now recognized his sinfulness. He's realized that he's been persecuting the body of Christ, the church of Christ, uh, the son of God. And he knows he's unworthy. He knows he has sin in his life. And what does Ananias tell him to do? Get up! and be baptized so that your sins can be washed away. So he too had to see himself as an unholy individual, a person with sin in his life. Well, how did God or his messengers and or his messengers respond to Isaiah's thoughts about, I'm not deserving, I'm unclean personally, and all the people among whom I live, are also unclean. How did they respond? Begin at verse 6 of Isaiah chapter 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. So he touched his lips with a hot coal from the altar. It, it's, uh, it's something to observe. First of all, why did he touch his lips? Well, the only answer I can give is not biblical. It's just an assumption. But he had just said, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And so, cleanse his lips, uh, which would, it seems to me, be symbolic of cleansing his entire life. Uh, so I think that's part of it. Uh, the word seraph, uh, which out of which the word seraphim comes, that word seraph means fire. And I wonder if that has any uh, anything at all uh, to do what's going, with what is going on here. But what I do know, what, whether I can answer any of those other questions that I have, 
or whether we wait until eternity to find out the answer. Here's what I do know, and you can see it as well as I do. Isaiah has now been cleansed. He felt with all of his being the uncleanness in his life, his unholiness, especially in the presence of a, of a totally holy God. And now his lips have been cleansed, representative, as I've suggested, of his entire being, and he is, is able then, because of that, to stand there and await, or to kneel there and await his instructions. So notice verse 8. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Having been cleansed, Isaiah readily responds to the Lord's request for somebody to go forth. I propose to you that people who are cleansed of their sins ought to be compelled to preach. Look, look at what Paul wrote. For example, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he really in that chapter he's talking about how that uh, the preachers ought to be paid for the work that they do. But but Paul never would accept pay. He used, he used that actually as an opportunity to not be accused of preaching for the money. He was preaching for souls. That's what he really cared about. But, but listen to him in uh, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 16. For I pre if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. I'm cleansed. I've been set free, Paul says. So woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. He was compelled to preach again. In Titus chapter 2, verse 14, he writes to the young preacher. And there he says concerning our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. He bought us. Have you ever bought anything and thought, oh boy, this is going to need some work? This is going to be need fixing up. This, this is a good thing. It's a, I like it. I want to have it. But wow, is it ever going to need some work? Uh, I, I know I we bought something like that years ago. It was an old, old rocking chair, probably an antique when we bought it. And that was now more than 40 years ago. Uh, but when we got it, we took it home. We began to clean it up. Oh, I know that probably devalued it in the eyes of collectors. But we wanted to be able to use the rocking chair in, uh, when we had children, or at least that was our hope, that we would have children. And so we cleaned it so that it was usable. Uh, I like to watch these programs on TV where people take old rundown houses and totally remodel them and make them look beautiful again. Well, uh, if you think about it here, when you look at what Paul said to Titus, uh, Jesus bought an old rundown sin filled, wicked life. And once he bought us, then he, uh, once he bought us back from sin, then we were purified to be a people zealous of good works, on fire with good works. So cleansed, as it were, by the fire, if you think about Isaiah, and then on fire doing good. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, uh, to some extent, I think Peter joins uh, the Apostle Paul and what he has to say when he writes there, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We have been set free and we ought to praise God for it. That's what Isaiah did. That's what he wanted to do. That's what Paul did. That's what Peter talks about doing. We are cleansed. We owe God our lives. We ought to dedicate ourselves to telling others. That's what he really wants. So look at verses 9 and 10 uh, of Isaiah 6, where it continues. And he said, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy, 
and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart, and I return and return and be healed. Excuse me, not I return, but and return and be healed. They return to God and they'll be healed. And God's not ready to heal them. Why? Uh, for a good reason. They're rebellious people. They've been rebelling ever since uh, really they came out of the land of Egypt. They never really stopped that. He t sent them into ultimately into Babylonian captivity because of it. And when they came back, they didn't ever worship an idol again, not as far as we know, not in the biblical record they didn't. Uh, they, they were impressed. Uh, these words re are applied in the New Testament, the ones we just read, to people who have rejected the word of God because of their own attitude. And you see it, for example, in Mark chapter 4 and in Acts chapter 28 and in Romans chapter 11. Let's just look at one of those. Mark 4, of course, is the Lord as he walks on the earth. And look how he uses there uh, the words of Isaiah, which we have just read. And see if we can understand what's going on, at least just a little bit of what's going on here. So we want to look at Mark chapter 4, uh, beginning at verse 10. For it is written, he shall give, uh, I'm in Luke, excuse me, let me go back to Mark, since that's what I said. <laughs> Mark chapter 4, we want to begin at verse 10, and listen to what he says there. But when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable. And he said to them, To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, all things come in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn their sins be forgiven them. So what's the Lord saying? He's saying, you know, you've got to have an inquiring mind. You've got to want to know the will of God if you're going to be set free. And so Isaiah is writing to a people who didn't want to know God's will. Uh, they had it right there with them that in writing, they didn't choose to follow it. And so God says, well, uh, you, you go tell them that there, there are people who are going to see, but they're not going to perceive. They're going to hear, but they're not going to understand. Uh, these things are not going to come to them because the, I, I'm not going to cleanse them. Uh, they don't deserve it. Their attitude would not. Uh, would not cause them me to cleanse them. Paul told the Thessalonians about the the workers of deception who would not receive the love of the truth. That's in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 8 through 12. And I think you're getting a little element of that. You know, when you're involved in sin so much so you enjoy it above all other things, then you don't want to hear uh, what God has to say. So look at the beginning of of verse 11 then of Isaiah chapter 6 and here, then I said, Lord, how long? Uh, Isaiah, the prophet, wants to know how long this hardening state would exist in Israel. Uh, this sighing in the prophet uh, may have resulted uh, from the fact that he was, a, he was a part of those very people of people that long ago God had said, I'm going to cast you off if you do not pay attention to me. Go, go back with me, if you will, briefly to Exodus chapter 32 and hear what God said to the great prophet Moses, Exodus chapter 32, beginning at verse 9. And, and it seems that Isaiah is feeling somewhat what's going on there. So let's listen. And the Lord said to Moses, I've seen this people. And indeed, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and I will make of you a great nation. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak and say, He brought them out to harm them, to kill them, in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Well, Isaiah knew probably about the pleadings of Moses, and he knew you know, the way God reacted to an evil, to a wicked people. But, but he wants to know, how long is this going to last, Lord? 
How, how long are you going to feel this way toward your people? Now, listen to the end of that verse, verse 11, and on to verse 13 of Isaiah chapter 6, and we'll find out God's answer. And he answered, Until the cities are laid waste and without ha inhabitant, the houses are without a man, the land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. But yet a tenth will be in it and will return and be for consuming as a terebinth tree or an oak, whose stump remains when it is cut down, so the holy seed shall be its stump. So God says, I'm going to tell you how long this is going to last. These people are so bad, it's going to last until I finally empty this land. And he did. He sent the northern tribes to Assyria, and they were scattered all over the world. The southern tribes were, were Judah, was conquered by Babylon. They were carried off into Babylonian captivity for 70 years. Uh, they were in that captivity. It's a sad, sad uh, thing that went on with the people of God. The land really had, had as described by the prophet, it had its, its years of Sabbath. You see, every seven years they were supposed to let it lay fallow and not plant a crop. God said, I'll take care of you. There'll be enough seed, or there'll be enough harvest in, in the year before that that it'll feed you that year when you don't plant anything, and the next year while you plant and until the next harvest. It'll, it'll be available to you. God would have taken care of them if they didn't do that, they didn't follow the will of God. And so they had, they had to be in captivity so that all those years could be made up for, finally, uh, in their captivity. A remnant was brought back, here described as 10%, a small, small number of people. Uh, it's interesting that, that God uses two trees to describe this event, this coming back, and how they would, they would bloom again, so to speak, grow again. He uses the terebinth tree, and he also, uh, uh, well, excuse me, let me, let me look again. I'm a, I'm at the, the oak tree. Those are the two trees, the terebinth and an oak. That's in verse 13. And both of those trees are interesting. You can cut them down. And if you give them a little bit of time, you don't bother it. A new tree will start to come up out of the stump. And it will be restored. Oh, well, there'll be a new tree in that place. And that's the imagery that God uses of his people. They're wicked. They're going to pay for it. They're going to pay a terrible price. Isaiah is not going to live to see the end of this time that he, he longs to see the end of uh, because he understands what it means to be righteous, holy in God's eyes. He, he knows what his task is. He's going to carry it out. But it's going to be more sorrowful because they're not going to escape it uh, while he's alive. But God says the day is coming. The day is coming when, yes, my people finally will come back home. I hope that you and I look at this great meeting with God that Isaiah had, and that we come to the realization that each of us stands before God a sinner in desperate need of a Savior. Thankfully, he sent Jesus, his own son, to die on Calvary. In that death, he shed his blood. That blood can set me free so that though I once was unholy, I can be made holy. Now, when I am, I've got to be like Isaiah. I've got to be ready to go wherever God wants me to go. I've got to spread the news. Be prepared. If others do not turn, God will have to deal with them. And you and I may have to watch in horror and sadness. But believe me, the day's coming to an end. One day, Jesus will come back. We won't see a vision. We'll see the Lord in his glory.